Well, hey friends, welcome to today's podcast. We have a friend of the house. She was here years ago and we're excited to have her back. And you guys have asked to have her back. I'm sure she's so busy that we are blessed to be here today. Jenny Allen is with us, you guys, and she has written this new book. I'm, I'm going to do this for YouTube. There it is. Jenny Allen has written, Find Your People, Building Deep Community in a Lonely World. Jenny, welcome to the podcast. It's great welcome. to be back. Welcome back. Yes, yes. so good. My Thanks goodness. Me. Um, yeah, so this book, I, we were with you when you wrote your, um, for, was that your first book, The On Purpose and uh, well, so no, that was my third book. Nothing to prove was my nothing third to book. prove. Yes. yes. So that was your third book. So this, this is, is like, fifth. yeah. Okay. I have to jump right to the question as an author myself. How do you, do you love the writing or is it a love hate? It's a love hate. <laughs> I am a content person. It is probably how I, you know, breathe in the world. It's, uh -huh. it's like oxygen to me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think about it all the time, but I, yeah, I am definitely going to take a break after this book. <laughs> Are you going to take a break? Who's going to hold you accountable to that? Because if you live and breathe it, it can be kind of hard to step back. It can, but I, I'm ready for a break. And, you know, <laughs> the last one was so costly. The last two, I mean, Get Out of Your Head was that very was costly and, and has, has done a lot of good in the world. And I'm grateful for that. But in that, even it's been costly. And then, and then Find Your People was probably the hardest book I've ever written. Really? Uh, probably because it involves relationships and it involves people mm -hmm. I love and it just, it's super tender for me. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then it's, but I, I love it and I'm so proud of it. And it always feels so good on the other side when it's helping people. It's just the aloneness for a year and a half to two years while you're working on it that- Girl, you're that making me you cry. In. Yes, the aloneness. I've been in the cave. I'm I'm now on my third. And then the fact that the content creating that you do, and you do if gathering content creating too, do you? Or is that? Yeah, that's probably my main role with if is just to mm -hmm. think through like how, who's going to be there and how are we going to tie things together and, and mm -hmm. what are we going to bring to the world? So that's kind of my, yeah, that, that's how my brain is, is made. I'm, I'm vision and, mm -hmm. and thinking content, speaking, mm -hmm. speaking, writing, podcasting, all the things, you know, same as but you. It, but it does require you to kind of pull away into a cape, like pull away into that, that space where you're just yeah. creating. And well, the irony of this book um, is just that I was talking about finding people and I was alone writing a book for a year. So that was kind of hard, even on my yeah. friendships. In fact, the first chapter is really, it was written um, about a month or two from the end when I was editing. So this was just a while ago, a few months ago. And I rewrote the opening of the book because I was going through such a hard time of feeling like in writing about finding my people, I was losing my people mm. and really mm -hmm. had to go and practice everything I'd been preaching the whole book mm. to even restore some relationships mm. back into my life because writing is so lonely and I had mm. been alone so much. And I had this huge fear of coming out of writing the book and then going to talk about the book and losing all my people and, and it be, you know, basically being a fraud. And so mm. there was just even some warfare, I think around just how, how I would come out of this book and still have my friends. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, thankfully I do. And they're amazing, right. but and when you say losing disappear. your people, was it, it was COVID induced, correct? No, I think it was literally writing induced. I think I just, okay. I, this was just not long ago and okay. certainly COVID has played a part in all that, but I, I still kept my really good friends through COVID. We, we would meet outside, whatever we had to do. Um, but I do think writing is just so lonely that I, I was needing, <laughs> to just get out of writing. And so that's it's honestly just a real choice that I've been making of, I'm going to take an extra year this time and, yeah. and be with, be okay. with my people. Awesome. So then just give us the big heartfelt behind why this book, why the burden for this, because you definitely have to have a burden, I think, to write a book mm -hmm. <laughs> as painful sure. as it can be. Why the yeah. burden for this book? Well, actually uh, before, you know, this is probably five to eight years ago, the concept for the book came to me when I was traveling overseas and it was specifically Italy and Uganda and Rwanda and all these countries where village life is normal and people mm -hmm. live together at day in and day out. And 
there, you know, specifically in third world countries, a lot of them don't have doors on their huts. Like everyone's just in each other's lives. And, and I saw in villages, a lot of what you see online or is used to raise money for people to help, which is needed and true. But when you're there, everybody's really happy. Like in Africa, yes. like you got, yep. they're, they're living with a lot less, but, but you're watching them walk down to get their water and they're not frowning, they're giggling and they're Gosh. laughing. Like we would be, you know, on a girl's night. And so, and they're doing it every day. That's what they do every day together. And so mm. it really haunted me when I kept seeing that show up all over the world. And I remember specifically being in Italy uh, on a family trip with, to actually see some family members there. And so we stayed in this little bitty town that wasn't touristy. And I walk in the grocery store with my husband and everybody stops in their tracks. They're like, who are these people? Everybody knows each other. Everybody's spending, you know, an hour at the grocery, little bitty grocer that's the size of my bedroom, yeah. you know, yeah. um, getting their yeah. few perishable items. And then they'll be back the next day or, or two days from then. And they're all talking for an hour, you know, at yeah. the, at the grocer and who are these strangers? And, and yeah. it just, it haunted me that, that we're living so isolated, that we're living so interdependent. I mean, no, independently yeah. and not inter interdependently. And so the burden came from just watching other people live in a way that I thought was healthier. And I, it bothered me that we didn't. And so the way I approached the book was I was curious and I wanted to see what are we missing? Yeah. And I went from curious to brokenhearted because the research, if you look at every generation prior to the industrial revolution, if you mm. look at every culture today, in fact, 80% of the world lives in small villages around the world today and, and has a similar lifestyle where they require each other for survival. You know, that's, mm. that's been the majority of humankind. Mm. And now we Amazon, if we need an egg, you know, we don't even buy our own, <laughs> you know, we don't even borrow an egg from our neighbor anymore. So, True. so we've got a really, really broken cultural system that we're mm. functioning in. And mm. so I actually ended up very depressed in the research stage, stage of this book and, and truly wondering if there was a way to do it differently. And, and so, you know, there, there is a sense of, can we, can this change? Or is this just, is everything stacked against us? And we can. And the way I ended up writing the book was to look at those villages, to look at the scriptures, to go back to before the fall and say, what were the patterns of communal living and, and the healthy patterns of doing life together? Because yeah. God built humans and set them on the earth and said, it's not good for a man to be alone. You know, yeah. that was the first thing he said. So yeah. we've got to figure this out and we've got a communal God. So yeah. there's a, definitely a sense of we're built this way. So, so yeah. how do we live this way and how do we make different choices to bring that into our daily lives? And I think it scares everybody. But yeah. I think it's really exciting. And I think it could change the anxiety crisis we see, the depression yes. crisis we see. I really yes. think it could change everything. Yeah. So say, give us some takeaways or give us some something that you know the Bible points us to or practices or things that we know are essential for us to live this out. Well, you know, the patterns for me came from uh, specifically like looking at how people live. So, so it started for, with images. It was fires. You saw that throughout village mm. life. Um, and then you, and you see it throughout the Bible. You see a lot of fires, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of meals. You see yeah, a lot of tables. open doors. You see a lot of, I mean, even Jesus, you know, looking up at Zacche Zacchaeus and being like, Hey, we're going to your house for dinner. Like we're not yeah. just coming over. We're going to eat at your house. You need to yeah. get your people to cook. Like we're going to totally invade your privacy. Um, you see a <laughs> lot of initiation and you see a lot of connection and you see a lot of um, this idea that, that there's not so much separating us as we think. And, yeah. you know, we're, we live in a culture where boundaries is one of the best selling books. Uh, we have, we've really gotten great at boundaries. Uh, and I would just very say, good at them. yes. And I would just say, uh, we, we've gotten so good at boundaries that we don't even know how to live and love people anymore. Yeah. And so yeah. I think we've taken that way too far. I think there's a place for it for sure. People hurt yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, we hurt each other all the time. That yes. is going to be part of this, but the Bible was written for that. It was written yeah. for relationships that hurt each other. That's yes, the that's whole the thing word. is about that. Man, if you look at from word. Adam and Eve till revelation, you see people doing life together and it being a mess. That is the Bible was written for it. It wasn't written just for connection with God. There's a few scriptures about that, certainly, but largely it's about connection with God, with people. 
Uh huh. That's yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. In fact, almost everywhere the Bible says you, it actually is translated you all in the Greek and yeah. the Hebrew. Y'all. Yeah. Y'all. So there's definitely, we've made this even in faith and an independent practice. And yet wow. the world is, it has always been communal. We're, we're just some of the first generations in this culture that need to be reminded of that. And, and we have to discipline our lives to have it in it. Now, the cool part is of the book is I am not suggesting you move and start over or go to a third world country and build a hut. I'm suggesting that you look around you. And probably there's a woman that walks her dog in front of your house. And probably there's a, a Starbucks or a coffee shop you frequent. And there's somebody behind that desk that, that you could get to know. And probably the Sunday school teacher that takes care of your kids has a whole backstory that you would love to know. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we look for the three to five best friends. And in doing so, we miss the village. Mm -hmm. And my whole thing is reclaim the village mentality of, of when you have our, our we're built, we're hardwired, wired, science tells us for acquaintances to be about 150, meaning, you know, their name, you know, a little wow. bit about them. You probably don't know where they live exactly, but you know, they're, they live kind of in this part of town. Um, then you have the capacity for 50 relationships to take a casserole when you find out that their mother wow. just died. 50. <laughs> That's how many you could now, not all at the same time. You can't take a casserole, of 50 people, but I'm just saying you, you got about 50 names in your head that if you heard something bad happen to them, you'd want to do something for them. Now that's still oh, yeah. not your, your inner circle, circle of three to five. That's how many people you can rub shoulders with daily and keep up with, Oh, they're out of town this week. Oh, their um, their kid got in trouble at school this week. That's the more, that's your inner circle of what's really going in. That's our capacity. Now we live in a world where we hear the problems of the whole wide world. And so we've quit noticing the village because we're thinking about the globe. And there's wow. nothing wrong with that. I host things all the time, educating people how to help in Afghanistan or wherever, whatever crisis is going in the world. I'm not saying we neglect that, but our mental energy, our daily time, our daily energy needs to go to the relationships right in front of us. But because we're so exhausted by the globe, we no mm. longer care about the barista that we see every single day. Wow. And because we're so exhausted by the planet that we no longer care about our neighbor that is going through chemo. Hmm. And so what if our eyes, you know, not that we never glance up and see what's happening, but we really feel responsible for these 50. And we say these 50 are going to be the people we do life with. What will happen if you start to notice the 50 that you already see that your kid is on their sports team, that maybe you're, you're um, living in an apartment as a single and you've got neighbors that you can have a little party with, or you are a coworker with, or your cubicle is three down from like, mm -hmm. I'm talking about just the, the people you see on a daily basis, yeah. starting to see, see them as potential friends. Then what happens is you have a longer conversation with them tomorrow at work. You'll have a longer conversation with them when you're walking the dog. Yeah. And this just happened with some people reading the book early. One of the girls was like, okay, y'all today, instead of brushing by the girl, I see all the time at gymnastics. I had a 30 minute conversation with her and we had so much in common that she and her husband are coming over to play games next week. And they've been passing by each other for months, if not years. And it was just having a little 30 minutes instead of saying, Hey, and then get at your phone Damn. and it changed everything. Amen. And so that's Amen. my hope is, is not that you move, but that you start to notice who's already in your life. Yeah. And start to treat them like your village and start to yeah. bring them in and let them in and see if things don't change. So what happens when someone's 50 is in a social media feed? That's not your 50 then. <laughs> proximity <laughs> is proximity is the first pattern. Now that is not to say, because in village life, that was all there was. I mean, what I'm doing is I'm looking at biblically and historically, how has community worked? Because uh -huh. we're not good at it. And nobody would say we are. Uh -huh. Nobody alive today in a different country would say America is good the at truth. this. I mean, my sweet friend, Helen, moved from India. She lives in Chicago um, when she first gets here in a, in a basically a little India in Chicago. And she mourns for India. She misses it every day. And she still has her friends that are from India. And her kids live here. And I say, why, Helen, do you miss India so much? And she said, because of the meals and the time, one time we were on the phone when she's telling me this, she has her kids in the other room and they're about to have a meal together. 
And I said, well, you still, do you cook the same things? Is it, what is it? And she said, no, I'm sorry. It's not the meals. It's that in India, when we would have a meal, whoever you invited would come over that morning and they would help you cook and they would cut up things and they'd be with you all day in the kitchen and they'd stay until you were cleaned up at night. And she said, I miss the cooking and I miss the cleaning and I miss mm. the spending the whole day together because that's what you did in India when you had a meal together. Wow. Wow. And wow. I just, I just realized like, gosh, we hustle. We we're in a hurry. We sit down for 30 minutes max to have a meal yeah. together. And that's a long meal. And then we leave because we got to get home for something, a show, or, I mean, who knows what to get in our robe and watch Netflix. So I just, I feel like it's just changing my, what I told um, the, the group that's reading it early just now, I was just on a Facebook live with them. And, and I said, my hope is that you put on new glasses, that, that it's not that you feel like, oh, I've got to do something else. I've got to start a supper club. I got to do right. this. The hope is that you literally read this book and you put on new glasses and you just see every moment differently. Right. And you see it as an opportunity when you're going to Costco to call your friend that, that has a Costco membership and say, Hey, you want to go with me and, and push your carts next to each other. And, and I just, you know, I just pay, share all the toilet paper for goodness sake. I never can store that. I've, I've no storage in my house. And so I just think if you could, if you could just put on different glasses and start to see people, the, start to see the people in front of you and the opportunities in front of you, I think it could start to change the way we do life here. Does this come natural for you? Are no. you a people, you're not a people, like people are exhausting, are you exhausting no. to you, introvert, extrovert? Like I'm probably a little of both, but I would say people have hurt me. And mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. I was got really good at letting people so far in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and not any further and lost a lot of friends because of that, because they would say things like you, I need you, but you never need me. And I wouldn't be vulnerable with them. And I think I, I didn't want to be needy. I didn't want to complain. I didn't want to get hurt. It was easier to be there for them than to let them be there for me. And so I think a lot of this practice for me has been risking vulnerability and, picking up the phone and being known. And, you know, I have part of the book talks about, um, I have a friend that when you call her, if she's crying, she answers. <laughs> In fact, sometimes when she's crying, she calls you, which I, I couldn't, I was like, I am not a middle of the cry friend. I am not someone who like thinks to myself in the middle of a cry, I'm going to call someone. I'm the opposite. I actually will not call them that day. I will call like in three days when I've totally processed it and I figured out exactly what's wrong and can put a little bow on top and say like, oh wow. yeah, this week, this week I had a hard day about this, this, and this, and I'll explain it to you perfectly. <laughs> she would call me though, like sniffling and like not hadn't worked anything out. And she's furious. And she's like, I just, I'm so sick of this. Cause da, 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 da. And I'm like, I, I meet her and I'm like, I don't even have a category for you because I am so different than you. Yeah. But she has taught me that I call during the cry because it's during the cry that so I needed good. her. Yeah, that's a good word. Call I need during her. the cry. Amen. I need her then. I don't need her afterward when I've already put a bow on it. My sister did this last night for me. She she's going through so much. Her um, she just delivered a baby that they knew from for a long time that the baby um, was diagnosed with Down syndrome, and they're so in love with this child. That he's magic. We all are. We haven't mm -hmm. even been able to meet him yet, but mm -hmm. he just had to have open heart surgery. He's going to have, he's got kidney failure. Like his little body is just, it is mm -hmm. so hard and she's so tired. And she just mm -hmm. called me and bawled last night mm -hmm. and she tried to fit the bow on, you know, like we all do. And, and I got to just say, actually, Katie, why don't you just keep crying and not fix it tonight? Like, let's just and she, I was like, you haven't cried yeah. enough and so good. I'm not going to fix it. You're not going to fix it. Like, just keep crying. Like, let's not move to the, where we turn in the conversation and everything is okay. Wow. And we're just not great at that. Right. Like none yeah. of us are. Yeah. And that's the empathy. That's the definition of empathy is just to be able to be with someone in it and not have to bring solutions and not have to fix it. Like we definitely are fix it people here in the United States. So let me get this together. Let me Google. Let me find out what other resources I can have to make sense in order of this. Then I can present my case or 
whatever it might be, but there is definitely such a vulnerability. I can't, you say that I'm like, I can't remember I, the last time I received, well, now I can, now it came to mind. I guess I challenge everyone to try to picture a last time you had a phone call from someone where it was hard to understand what they were saying because they yeah. were in such a, such an emotional tailspin or whatever it is. And maybe how that made you feel for us too. We have to be able to, like you said, you, you kind of recoil at it, but now you're learning. Well, I re I don't recoil at all. When she calls me crying, I feel like the most important, valuable person in the world. And so now I understand like what those friends meant of how good mm -hmm. it feels to be needed. Uh -huh. We all want to be needed. We just, it's hard to be needy, right? We yeah. don't, yeah. we almost have to practice being the one that's needy for a lot wow. of us. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel so special and important that she would want to call me or talk to me. Mm. Like it was such an honor to be in that moment with my sister last night. And, and I hope I'm that kind of friend and, and I want, yeah. I want to be close enough and walk closely enough with people that they call me and in that cry, but I also need to be that person back, you know? And that, that's hard for you or you're learning to do that more. That's the part that's hard for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm sidebarring. What Enneagram number are you? I'm a seven, eight. Oh, you're I like everything to be happy. <laughs> oh, I'm an eight, seven. So I go more towards the, let's fix this thing up. Let's this, yeah. like, let's get after it instead of, okay, let's just let it be what it is today. We don't have, yep. we can feel our feelings and not be overcome by them. Okay. Let's talk. We're, we're neuroscientists, uh, nerds around here a little bit, well, a lot of bit, because yep. we always talk about the mind body connection, how God has made us this integrated people. So um, let's talk about loneliness and what you learned about the scientific effects on us and our mental health and well being. Uh, I mean, they're devastating again. We've got a lot of devastating mm. news here. The problem's big. <laughs> um, there's nothing that is more damaging to your physical health. Let's start with physical mm. than loneliness. Scientists are saying that loneliness is more destructive to your physical health than obesity, than smoking, mm. Mm -hmm. than drinking. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is more damaging than just about any other thing you could do to your body. Wow. And good. so, you know, <laughs> I mean, people always cock their head at that, like, really? And I'm, I mean, just look it up. Yeah. Uh, then yeah. two, because I didn't do that research. I just found it. Um, <laughs> then two is we've got an issue with, um, with our mental state. I mean, how many of us are struggling with anxiety? How many of us are struggling with uh, depression, with suicidal thoughts? I mean, there's, this is all on the upward trajectory at a rate that yes, is it so is. alarming, yes, so alarming. Is. Yeah. And I would make the argument that this is the greatest weapon we have against it. My last book was called get out of your head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody said, did you write this? Because after you get out of your head, then you can find your people. And I was like, no, it's actually your people are going to help you get out of your head. It was the best. That was how God changed me and get out of your head was through bringing people in. And mm -hmm. so I see it as the most important weapon against mm -hmm. anxiety, against Mental depression yeah. is to bring people into it. When that friend calls me crying, actually what happens for her rather than me who waits till I'm all better, she shares with me and her neuro pathways are actually beginning to heal. And so with in connection with yeah. someone else, even better in person than mm -hmm. on the phone, mm -hmm. um, but the tears and my voice and my, my looking at her and my nodding is healing something in her pathways without me ever saying a word, like just empathetically listening and being present yes. with someone heals yes. things in people that, that cannot heal any other way. That is how we were built to connect and to heal. And so you see, you know, something called mirror neurons. I talk about and get out of your head where someone's listening. It's really cool feature of the brain. Um, someone's listening to someone else and they begin to make the same faces the other person is making just innately without thinking about it. So someone is furring their brow and, and you start to furrow your brow and you're not thinking about it. It's just that you both feel empathetically. You're, you're basically, your, your brain is empath empathizing with them to such a point that you're mirroring back to them. Body. Yeah. Yes. What you're seeing. Yeah. And so, well, gosh, that's a human gift, right? That's, that's too comfort <laughs> more yeah. with those who mourn. It actually yeah. physically is built into our, our psyche to do that. God put it there. And so it's beautiful. We, we need each other to heal. And, 
you know, I think my husband, I remember my little girl, she's a lot like me. We both are like, what's the point? Why talk about it? It's a problem we can't solve. You can't fix it. I can't fix it. Talking about it is just dwelling on it. Sounds like I can, I'm complaining. Don't see the point. And she would say that to me. And I would, it would sound very familiar to things I've thought. I don't know if I've been brave enough to say, but what she's learned, I'm like, well, how's that going for you? Because what's happening is her anxiety is actually growing once it's internalized. When you say it out loud, uh, you actually exhale. When you say it out loud to someone else, you begin to heal and something in you decompresses. And that little girl has gotten so good. In fact, she, she laughs about it now, but she cries to me all the time. She never used to cry to me. And now she comes in and just cries and vomits everything because it's yes. so good. And she's noticed a difference and she's <laughs> noticed it's been healing for her. Y'all, she's 16. Some of us mm -hmm. are 60 and we still have never practiced this. We have never mm -hmm. done this. Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, it changes everything. That reminds me, for, and this is where everyone, we have to you know, do our own work, do our work, get out of our head, get with the Lord, know that we're prone to pull back and be isolated in our own self, separated from God and others. My daughter is very, she's a feeler. But when she was younger, when I was more in a young mom, still doing my work, healing my, doing my, healing up my junk, her emotions would rock me. Like if she had a high emotion, it would, you would think as a mother, it would draw you in, you know, to come close in connection, but it would actually freak me out a bit and it would draw away. And then I noticed our friendship, our relationship kind of getting more distanced as he, she became more of a teenager, just kind of trying to hold it all together because she didn't want to upset me until God does what God does and answers prayers as I knew that there was some healing and reconnecting that I was doing to me and she was having done to her and some therapy. And then all of a sudden her just like floodgates opened of crying, like almost for four, six years, she just kind of held crying back because it was something we didn't know what to do with. It was overwhelming in a way. But now she cries, so she cries and she is not afraid of it. And we just let her cry and we hold her when she's crying. We don't feel upset by it. And there's this real connection that comes because I don't, we don't have to solve it. Crying isn't a bad thing. You get to feel your feelings and then we stay connected in the community. She loves crying to the point. She goes, just feels so good. After she's done, oh, I just so feel true. so good. I'm like, you're so amazing. You're yes. like, you are so fit in that way. Cause most people want to push it down and get past the moment. And it, sometimes it comes out. So yes. I love, I love that you're encouraging people that this is, this is the way we come to connection with each other and this vulnerability. What do we do inside of, uh, you talk in the book about inconvenience, inconvenient friendships and kind of pushing into that. What, what does that mean? Cause most people are like, I'm out inconvenience. I just got a DM today in Instagram. A woman said, how do I keep loving someone while knowing they've hurt me before? And I don't want to be hurt again. How do I, you know, that love and boundary thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're really quick to run. Yes. We have that luxury back to the village life. Most mm. people never moved more than 20 miles from where they were born. So they lived with their family and their friends most of their life. And so they had to work it out. You, you just, you know, didn't, you couldn't go very far. And now we all can move in and out of relationships with a very transient yeah. mood about it. We don't, we don't need them. They yeah. hurt us move on. And yeah. so we never learned a conflict. We never resolve it. Yeah. We never uh, have long-term friends over decades or over generations, which is really the goal and the model throughout the Bible and the model throughout um, history. So we don't ever grow, you know, we, we just, it's very obvious why we're so lonely because we're starting over our friendships every time they hurt us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just not helpful. And the whole Bible was written to give instruction to live out our faith with humans. Yeah. So things like encourage one another, uh, forgive one another, admonish one another. These Bear are one another really, burdens. Mm -hmm. These are really messy. They sound pretty, they sound poetic, but they're actually really messy. I mean, when I Amen. feel misunderstood and that friend just gossiped about me in her misunderstanding of what I said, I feel utterly betrayed misunderstood. I don't want to see her again. I literally want to push her away. And I don't want to rather than what scripture says, which is forgive one another and bring mm -hmm. that offense to her. 
and say mm-hmm. it to her rather than go to my friends and be like, mm-hmm. you'll never believe what so-and-so did. And so we, I call that person and I say, Hey, this hurt me. And I don't think you meant to, but, but it really hurt me when you, when you gossiped about it. And, and can we, can we make amends here? And, and at that point, it's up to her. She may be ticked. She may be shocked. You just brought that to her, but at least you've, as much as it's concerned you, you've tried to live at peace with all. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say most of the time, the healthy friendships, and certainly the ones that read this book are going to lean in and they're going to say, okay, let's, let's work this out. And, Mm -hmm. and, and so I think a lot of times everybody's just hurt, hurting each other over and over again, like um, pinballs and they, they're just mm. bouncing up off each other's lives and they never mm. stop and like settle and, mm. and commit. And mm. so the, the hope, the last pattern we talk about is consistency. And, and what that means is it's staying even when you're hurt and working it out yeah. and not just quitting those friends because they hurt you and running from that. Okay. We touched on a little bit before we go, there's two more big questions I want to ask you. Uh, social media, give us your take. I mean, it's fine, but it's not what I'm talking about. This book's not about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, okay. I mean, so then it broke everything. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the obvious problem of our generation, but I, I don't think it's evil. I'm on it. I just don't expect totally. it to do something. I don't expect it to be my community. There we when, go. When everybody's out there showing me their vacations, it's like, great. That should give me a starting place to talk with a friend in person about their kid that that just went on a trip or, or they, you know, the thing that they just had happened to them this week, but it should not be, no, that is not community. That is not what I'm talking about. Amen. Okay. So now you got to realize a lot of lists, a lot of people are behind their screens, behind their phones. We know that we're listening on podcasts right now. I, you know, someone's in their ears, no one else is hearing it. It's just them getting this message. How does a person move out from, okay, I feel it. I'm lonely. I'm using Facebook. I'm doing all these things to try and substitute. It's not getting anywhere. What would you say to them to their well, next place of movement? All the little choices. And I hope people will get the book because I hold yeah. your hand because I know yes. this is a huge ask. This is not something we can figure out on a 30 minute podcast. Mm-hmm. You have like, I, I literally hold your hand because this should have been a class in first grade. You know, it should have been how good. to conflict how to conflict resolve, so how to make friends, how to, so how true. to be vulnerable. We should have learned that in, in, in sixth or first sixth grade for sure, but mm-hmm. we should have learned it right away, but we never did. Nobody mm-hmm. ever taught us this. And so I almost felt like I was in elementary school. Some of the things I said, but those are the things I needed. I need somebody to say, this is how you ask someone to be your friend. So this good. is how you call someone to go to coffee. I mean, I, I go that granular good so that job. no one has an excuse. Like you will you will know what to do. And then at the end of a lot of the chapters, I give like 50 ideas of how to practice that thing with people right in your midst, whether it's borrowing something instead of buying on Amazon next time, whether it's going and saying, Hey, do you need help cleaning out your closet? Like, let's go do that together. Like just doing things together that people have done throughout history that most people today do all day. Like nobody's living alone in the rest of the world. We're all with our fences and our alarm systems and our screens, but 80% of the world lives in village life right now. And they depend on each other for survival and we don't, and that's fine. We can't change that. Don't think we should, but I do think we should make better choices about depending on each other by choice, even though we don't, even though we don't need each other in the same way, most of the world always has. I love you guys just heard it. And I do have a copy of the book well, an early edition copy and I love that you do do the practical things. Like, let's start over from the beginning. Here's you're gonna. Yeah. Here's how you're gonna ask someone for coffee. Here's how you're gonna yeah. feel basic. Well, and hopefully, I love your ministry because you bring people together through working out. We actually really bond by not looking at each other. So, coffee uh-huh. dates are fine. We should do those. But I did a whole thing on that fire. And working out is the same thing. When you're looking at a fire, you actually open up more. Your neural pathways relax. Love you, it. Um, you're not face to face with a lot of pressure. Same thing with working out. Yeah. They're doing something together is actually a great way to bond. Yeah. But we don't live in a culture where that happens a lot. So we got to make choices to do that. But do. even if people already have their people, I think looking at it from a different angle, I think my hope is that it will deepen those friendships and you'll see like even just how little you actually have interaction with people in your life and how much is possible. So good. Okay. And we have a community of 
thousands of Revelation Wellness instructors, people that are using fitness as a tool, disciple, you guys are listening. This is a book for you to get your communities to get, to walk through, like to be, we have a saying, find your people, love your people. So this cool. is a book, literally find your, we have found the book <laughs> to that. find our people. So go yep. get this book. And as you were talking, Jenny, I just had this picture of your last three books um, with nothing to prove that felt like that was in something of the heart, right? Like the God, the, that's a message of the heart, nothing to prove. And then you move to the head, get out of your head is like, okay, we got to work up there. And now you've moved to the hands of yeah. now go reach out for people. Head, hands, heart. It's yes. so beautiful. Maybe I'm done. Maybe, maybe I, I did it. Maybe you I wrote definitely, everything I have to say. <laughs> you definitely have a break. We are going to give you a break, girl. You go have a break. All right. Fun, fast fire questions before you yep. go. Um, coffee, tea, or kombucha. What's your go-to? Uh, tea. Oh, it's so lovely. A spe specific kind? Well, I usually will choose. I will do hot tea, but I'll, I'll usually do iced tea everywhere, nice. even in the morning. Yeah. With breakfast. I love iced tea. I love a good iced tea myself too. I'm a kombucha girl though. If you put one in front of me. I love kombucha. I love it oh. all. I'll <laughs> drink it all. And a uh, favorite way to move your body. Uh, Pilates. I did oh, it this yeah. morning. Reformer Pilates. I oh, do it God. three to five times a week if I can. I took one last favorite. week. I took one last week with a friend of mine who takes it consistently. I'm like, that is a slow death. <laughs> It is the most painful thing. The mo and I asked, I actually, one of my friends as a counselor loves it too. And I said, why do we love it so much? Like it's the first workout I've ever just like craved. Like I cannot cool. wait to go. Cool. And she said, you love it because it's one of the only workouts that you cannot think about anything else. Oh, that you, is that true. Machine, that machine will bite you back. It has to be so disciplined yeah. that if I, if my brain even <laughs> wanders to my phone or it'll inject else, you, it will shoot me off that thing. <laughs> And you will be get seriously injured. And so I didn't know why I loved it so much, but it's so true. I don't even have time to think yeah. about my phone while I'm doing it. Yeah. I just have to focus the whole time. Yeah, that is very true. Yeah. Maybe that's why I can't stand it. I like to be able to create, I, it's in movement that I create, I think content, I have conversation, like it's more active for me where that just felt like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. My, yes. my glute is about to pop out of my skin. I know. Um, okay. And then favorite, um, active wear brand, where you shop and get what you wear. Well, I just went nutso at target recently. I got this thick pullover. They have, a they have a great brand right now. It's called one day something. I can't remember exactly. I didn't huh? know I was going to be asked that question today, Girl. but I just ripped off the tags of three more of them because they're just <laughs> great, thick, like never wear out sweat stuff. I can put over like my leggings and and things. Target. That's a yep. find everyone. Target. Yep. Head over there now. I'm sure it'll be depleted by the time yes. this comes yep. out. All right, Jenny, thank you for being here. You guys go to amazon.com. The book is, is, if you guys are hearing this now, I believe it just came out. I think we're releasing this right the week that you're coming out. So let's drive this book again to a best times uh, list, a New York Times bestseller. I'm sure it's going to do great because people need this message. You can mm -hmm. also go to jennyallen.com as well, you guys, to find out more of what Jenny's up to and all the things we didn't even mention. We mentioned if gathering a little bit, just that little thing you do discipling a nation <laughs> once a year around the world, there's that going yeah. on. So, well, we're so great. Thanks for having me. And I'm so grateful for what y'all do. You are actually like the, the bones of what I'm talking about. I mean, you're on the ground living. Yes, it it's just so great. It. So Boots thanks for having me, Elisa. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for watching. And remember, this video was brought to you by Revelation Wellness Instructor Training Program. Do you love Jesus and have a passion for fitness and wellness? Or maybe you're tired of the roller coaster of obsessing over and neglecting your body, and you know there has to be more to fitness. Let us equip you to lead others to health and wholeness rooted in Jesus Christ through our faith-based fitness instructor training program. Go to our website to learn more and listen to testimonies of people just like you who are bringing hope and healing to their communities as fitness teacher gospel preachers. Click the link in the description of this video and download a packet to get your journey to health and wholeness through Christ started today.